Hello and welcome, my name is John Dickinson, and in this walkthrough tutorial, I'm going to show you how I created this look using Cinema 4D with After Effects and with various Sapphire effects, specifically focusing on the fabulous Ultra Zap and Ultra Glow effects. So let's just jump straight in. Now before we jump across to After Effects and look at how I set up that look, I wanted to just take a moment here in Cinema 4D just to mention the key things that I've done here. And the first of all, of course, is to model this Mad Scientist device. And you can grab this model from the download links and use it yourself. I've also added some materials, just some simple materials, and added some lights. Now I'm using the Redshift Renderer. If I just drag the render view across here, you can see this is how it looks in the render view. And lighting is done using obviously Redshift lights. I've used a dome light and a an key and fill light, which you can't see, they're out of the viewable area. And also a couple of point lights. And I wanted to point these out because just drag the time indicator, you can see how that light at the top there is sort of changing in scale. And there is a light positioned at the top and there's a light positioned inside the jar because this is where the ultra zap sits in the look one inside the jar and one between these two spheres. Now because I'm not actually putting Ultra Zap in Cinema 4D, I'm not getting any reflections or any kind of interaction between the Ultra Zap and the 3D elements. So I've kind of faked that by having the light flickering, or this pink light flickering uh, on these objects and inside the glass. You can see how it sort of bounces up and down in scale. And that's done just by using Simple Espresso with some noise, animated noise, just piped into the exposure of the light. If I just select the light here and see, come down to uh, exposure, you can see how that's linked up to an expression. So look at this value here, as I drag the current time indicator, you can see that value is changing. So the, the exposure amount of the light is changing, it's going up and down, which gives me some variation in exposure on all of these objects that are being illuminated and also inside the jar. So it's a bit of a fake, but it, it looks quite effective in After Effects. And obviously you can see as I'm dragging the time indicator that there's a little, um, little animation on this. I've just animated the camera just to sort of sweep around the object, make it look a little more you know, dramatic. And that was rendered out in, uh, from Cinema 4D using AOVs. Now AOVs are discussed in length on YouTube, plenty of tutorials about AOVs. Basically they're multi-pass renders for Redshift. And the key thing here uh, is this Cryptomat AOV. And this is what I've used in After Effects to create the mats that I need to set up the composite. Now, I didn't end up even using the specular lighting pass and I didn't um, render any other passes. Obviously you can build your entire final look using all the different passes. I tend to be a bit lazy. I don't do a lot of VFX, a lot of compositing. so. I tend to use the beauty pass for most of my things. I thought I might use specular because of the glass of the jar, thought I might be able to use that, but ended up not using it. But the key here is to look at the crypto mat. You can see I've, I'm using a crypto mat uh, layer for the material names. So every different material will have its own mat pass and also for object ID. So I've actually in Redshift on certain objects, like uh, this sphere, for example, you can see under object ID, I've given that an object ID because I, I felt that I needed certain things to have their own object ID. That way, if you have two different objects with different materials, but they have the same object ID, then they will be included in the same part of the map pass. So hopefully that makes sense. So that was rendered out as EXR sequences and brought across to After Effects. So let's whip across to After Effects and start breaking this down. Okay, so here in After Effects, it's pretty simple. We've got the main composition, which is the final rendered composition. We've also got this machine composition. I'm calling this the, the machine or the mad scientist machine. And in here, I've got all of the different passes that I've rendered out of Cinema 4D. So let's just look at this from bottom to top and see how this is composited and why I did it this way. Now at the very bottom, we have this gray purple solid and that's just faking some you know purple light 
from inside the jar. You can see it's got a big soft mask on it. Above that, we have this background layer. Let me just turn this one off again. You can see how that actually fills in that transparency there and also adds a little bit of you know, more pinky purple light in here. Now let's take a look at the effects that have been applied because that looks rather strange, doesn't it? With that selected, I'm just going to come up to my effect controls. I'm going to turn off all of these effects. All right. So you can see how I've got my machine cut out of the background. So I guess the first thing we need to do is double click this background comp and take a look at what's going on in here. So we have this beauty pass. If I double click that, we can look at that in the footage panel. We, we saw that that was one of the AOV passes in Cinema 4D. Above that, we have this crypto material ID layer, and that's being used as a mat using Luma Mat Invert or Luma Inverted Mat. We just turn that on. You can see there's my mat. So I'm just, I've actually duplicated this layer, this crypto material layer. I just want to show you how that was all set up. So let me just turn this one on. Let's close the footage panel. It looks a little strange. It's just a bunch of different colors. When you import a crypto mat render into After Effects, what it will do is automatically apply the crypto mat effect. And this is how it will look. Now keep in mind, this isn't a crypto mat tutorial. There's plenty of tutorials about how to use crypto mat on YouTube, you can check out. I actually watched tutorials to learn how to use it because this was the first time I'd even used crypto mat and I was quite excited by what I was able to do with it. So we have these different colors based on the different materials that were used in Cinema 4D because this is the material ID pass. And in order to choose different parts for the mat, all I have to do is hold down the shift key and just click on the element and that makes it part of the mat. When I found out I could do this, I was super excited. I'll just click on the different things. Obviously I want everything, so I'm just gonna click on pretty much everything and click on the glass. The glass is a bit tricky to uh, add to the selection, so I'm just gonna hold down the Alt key and click on the background. That gives me those scissors and that removes that and just add these little pieces of metal here. I might have to zoom in on these. A little tricky to see these ones. There we go. So once I've selected all of my colors, I can view that as matted colors or matted RGBA, so that gives me my alpha channel, or matte only, which gives me my Luma channel or my Luma matte. You can see how really easy it is. I can create mats for all of the different objects based on object ID or material ID, bring that into After Effects just as one sequence, but still have access to all of my different objects mats, either together or independently. So CryptoMat is definitely something worth checking out. Let me just delete that and just turn that one on. And you can see how I've matted out everything except the background. Because what I'm doing is I'm adding some blur to the background, some rack defocus, so that I can separate the foreground machine from the background. That's why I had to isolate it. And there's the layer there. So let's take a look at the effects that I used. First of all is exposure. You can see the exposure is not very high on this. And I'm using 32-bit files, so I've got a little bit of flexibility. A little bit of exposure to brighten up the background. And then importantly, Rack Defocus. So using Sapphire's Rack Defocus effect, it's a nice fast defocus effect. Gives me a nice natural kind of lens blur. But notice when I do that, it also blurs the edges of the alpha. And that's definitely a problem when I turn on these other layers. As you can see, we start to get this kind of halo effect. So I had to find a way to pull those edges back in so that we no longer see these transparent areas. And to do that, I use After Effects Minimax effect. So using the operation maximum and a radius of 110, if I turn that on, you can see how that pulls that in. Let me just turn this off. It looks kind of weird. Let me just turn it on and off. So that's before. That's after, so it's pulled in those edges, and they're now hidden 
underneath the passes that go above that, which is really great. So I get to blur my background layer and I don't have to worry about those transparent edges. So Minimax is one of those great After Effects effects that's been there forever and can be really, really useful. And next we have the curves effect just to pull down the greens a little bit to increase the sort of magenta pinkiness of the background and bring up the blue a little bit as well. So that's how the background layer was treated. Obviously that's really important to start with that. And of course we have this sort of light in the background. There is a little bit of transparency happening in here, but when that's turned off, you don't really see it. And I'm not rendering this out with an alpha channel, so that's all good. Okay, so above that we have the jar. So the jar is once again using the crypto matte material. Just this little part here, so the lid and the glass. And the reason I broke the jar and the wires and the cones up separately is because I wanted to give them their own treatments. If I applied the same exposure effect to all of them, then it didn't actually look that good. I wanted to treat them individually. So a little bit of exposure applied to these jar layers. You can see what a difference that makes. And above that, we have these wires. And you can see the exposure effect again. Slightly different exposure settings, but also with a little bit of curves to make these a little more pink. Above that, we have these, I've called them cones. And once again, using my crypto mat allows me to very quickly and easily select those. And exposure and curves. Above that, we have another cones layer. I probably should have actually added different materials to the top ones and the bottom ones. That would have meant I wouldn't have to use things like masking and after effects. And lastly, all of the metal layers. All of the metal objects. These internal objects and these ones at the top. Just turn off the material there. So all of those individually treated objects or groups of objects on top of the background that has been blurred using Sapphire Racti Focus gives you a pretty nice result. It's quite a, a realistic and convincing looking depth of field effect. So that was the machine treatment. So if we go back into our main composition now, let's take a look at the effects that I've used on top. I'll just solo that, come up to my effect controls. You can see to the machine layer, I've used Ultra Zap. Now, Ultra Zap was recently released by Boris FX. It's one of the brand new effects in Sapphire 2021. And if you're familiar with the Zap effect in Sapphire, then you're going to love the Ultra Zap effect. Definitely check out the Sapphire 2021 release tutorial where I go into a little more specifically about what Ultra Zap can do. But for now, let's just take a look at what I use to create this look. And pretty much, I just use one of the presets. If I just twirl open Ultra Zap and click Load Preset, this is one of the presets that I created for the Ultra Zap release. And this one specifically, no surprise, is called Mad Scientist. I'm going to cancel that. Now, one of the most important things that I've done is use the inbuilt Mocha tracking to track the start point and the end point to these spheres. And I had these little hotspots that were created by the light in Cinema 4D. And these are where I wanted the start of the bolts and the end of the bolts to attach to. So coming into Mocha by clicking on Edit Mocha, I've already tracked this and that was as simple as turning off all of the control points that I wasn't using, except for start point and end point, then just adjusting my search area and moving the start point cross right in the center of that hotspot for start and the same on the end point. So I'm using Mocha's excellent planar tracking to track this and then just attaching the end point and the start points to these little blue crosses. That took just a couple of minutes to set up. Then I tracked that 
Once I'd done that, click save. I'm not going to save this because I've already set it up. And I had a perfect track. And notice also that Mocha has overridden the start and end points indicated by the heads up display. Ultras app has a lot of different settings. One of the key things that I'll point out, let me just come up here to the effect control panel, is that we have the primary bolt and primary bolt animation and branchiness, but we also have a secondary bolt. So you can see here, I've got a slightly thicker primary bolt and I've got a finer secondary bolt. So this is one of the key differences between Ultra Zap and Zap. Zap doesn't have a secondary bolt and that's really useful because it allows you to create some really nice intricate looking Zap effects. And notice also that the primary bolt's branches are slightly thicker and slightly less transparent than the secondary bolts branches. You can see they're slightly finer and slightly more transparent. So that kind of pushes those ones into the background and gives this bolt structure a lot more depth. So you can definitely make much more detailed and intricate zap looks using Ultra Zap. One other thing I'll point out here too, also in Ultra Zap, is that we have a taper setting. So I was able to taper the start and come up to a thicker bolt in the center and also taper the end. And that's not something you can do in the zap effect. Notice also that we have this lovely glow. Ultra Zap has the Ultra Glow effect built in, and that's yet another reason to use Ultra Zap over the zap effect. But of course, Ultra Glow exists as its own effect, and I've used that to my advantage by applying Ultra Glow to an adjustment layer. Let's just turn that on. See the difference here. So I've got the Ultra Glow setting on Ultra Zap, let me just twirl that open. I've got my glow width quite small. You can just adjust that. You can see if I bring it up, it pulls the glow away from the bolts. I want it to have the width quite low because that makes the glow sit closer to the bolt and gives you this nice glowing hot core. And while Ultra Glow's after glow setting, definitely helps add a softer overall glow. I actually like to add a second ultra glow layer on top using an adjustment layer to add even more glow effects and to help better integrate the zap in with the other layers. And notice how here with ultra glow, just twirl this up, I'm using the after glow setting to my advantage by playing around with the horizontal streaks. You can see this streak here. I just reset that. It looks okay, it's still giving you this lovely soft overall glow, but I just love that streaky effect that you can create using the afterglow. Let's just turn that on and off again. So without and with, isn't that lovely? So having ultra glow in ultra zap is great for really customizing your ultra zap bolts. But then applying Ultra Glow again gives you the ability to do this kind of thing. Really nice, soft, overall, beautiful glows with lovely soft fall off. And you can see in the preview how that horizontal streak just adds a lot more impact and interest to this look. So that's the treatment for the top Ultra Zap, but there's also an Ultra Zap down here inside the jar. Let's have a look at that. I'm going to turn that on. I'm just going to turn these other layers off. And you can see I've also used this crypto mat layer as a Luma inverted mat. I'm just going to say no track mat. And here's the ultra zap for the lower layer. So this ultra zap is based on the mad scientist, but I've removed the branchiness. And I've also used some masks to have these bolts follow along the masks. And also importantly, turned on the loop setting. I just will open ultra zap. Another thing that makes Ultra Zap different from Zap is the bolt animation loop settings. So I've kept loop speed at its default of one. That means we'll get one full loop over one second. So let's just preview this. So you can see those bolts are moving along the masks. And the reason they're moving along those masks is because I've chosen follow selection all paths. I could have chosen selected paths, but I want it to go along both masks. So when the bolt reaches the bottom of the mask, 
then it comes round and starts at the top again. And this is all automated, there's no keyframes. Once again, notice how I have actually turned off the branchiness. We might just play with the branchiness in a moment. Let's just turn those on again. So I had these ultrazap bolts sitting in front of this sort of metallic, uh, I guess, conductive metal. And it wasn't quite as convincing, I thought, as it would be if I had the bolts sort of, I, I guess they're, they're being, um, they're emanating from this piece of metal here and they're coming underneath this plate and then they're coming down. So what I decided to do was use Cryptomat again. Let's just solo that. And just use, just disregard this top. Remember we had the cones is using the same material. That's why you can see the top um, cones. But if we just come into that composition, I've used the cones. But I've also used the object ID pass. Remember in Cinema 4D we talked about adding different object IDs. I've used an object ID pass just to create an object ID for these tiny spheres and this little strip of metal. I knew I wanted this specific piece to hide the bolts. Let me just come back to main and turn this on. I'll turn on Luma inverted mat. You can see how that's hiding the bolts. I'll just turn on the background. So I specifically wanted these to hide the bolt, but then I realized that some of the bolts were overlapping this area here, this object here, this lower cone, and also this metal here. So I needed to add that to the mat. Let me just preview that. There, you can see how we can see the bolt above that and I needed to add this particular object and this object to that mat in order to hide that. And I've done that just in this uh, in this comp just by using the crypto mat layer with material name and with object ID and just using the add blend mode just to add those together to create just one mat. So that looks a lot better than having the bolts on top of everything. Having them just hidden by that mat just makes them feel as if they're a little more integrated into this look, into this shot. Now I'm also using another ultra glow adjustment layer, this time isolated to these bottom ultra zaps. And this is pretty much a duplicate of the bottom ultra glow layer. I've just reduced the horizontal streaking just a little bit. But once again, that's really beneficial for adding that really overall lovely soft glow and helping composite all of those layers together. Because remember, when you apply glow to an adjustment layer, it pulls that bright glow in front of these slightly darker objects, which makes them feel far more integrated. That's off, and that's on. And see how that's pulling that glow up in front of that uh, horizontal strip of metal. So that's how it looks so far. I wouldn't mind just coming in and just making a few adjustments maybe to the loop speed and the branchiness of these bolts. So we come down to ultra zap lower. Let's give myself some space here. I'm gonna move to a frame where I can see those bolts clearly. And if I just type in branch, So if I just come down to bolt branchiness and just increase that branchiness, obviously with these kind of bolts, I wouldn't like, I wouldn't really want long branches. If I just increase that slightly, could add a little more interest to this, just like maybe like that. Have a look at how that looks. Yeah, that could look really good. And we have secondary bolt branchiness. I'm gonna twirl this up and down again so I can see everything. 
we can adjust the secondary bolt branchiness independently. See, we've got a really, really, really low secondary bolt length. Bring that right down. Once again, having these two separate bolts allows you to really fine tune the look. That doesn't look too bad. They're probably a little too long. Probably those primary ones are a little too long. I just bring those back. Bring that branch length back. You know, something like that. Yeah, that looks good, doesn't it? So much fun to play with. And I thought maybe I could just uh, adjust the looping speed. So maybe for the primary bolt. Just bring that up, see what that does. You can see how we get a lot more loops now per second. And that's actually not a bad look either. Get that really beautiful flashing effect. I, I don't know, I, I think I might even prefer that. Maybe just a, a little lower. So we get a little bit of space between them. Yeah, that looks great. Okay, so that's my machine layer and my Ultra Glow and Ultra Zap layers. The final thing really was just a couple of Sapphire film effects. Specifically, film damage and film effect. Let me just turn those off. I like to use Sapphire Film Effect for an overall filmic grade. And with Film Effect, I can do things like choose different film stocks. I can do some overall color correction. Also, add grain. And if I'm working with fields, I can control those as well. For this, I just use the default settings. But I have increased the scale color correction. At its default, it was a little bit dark. Notice how it is becoming more magenta because I have adjusted the print lights green. By increasing that, I've just decreased the amount of green, which has increased this sort of magenta look. If I take that down, that's going to pull that out and make that more green. So Sapphire is not really known for its color correction tools, but S Film Effect is really useful for a lot of the sort of basic color correction things that I need when I'm creating these kind of looks. And I've purposely decreased the amount of grain in the film effect because I've added grain using Sapphire Film Damage. And Sapphire Film Damage gives me that lovely overall classic film damage look with scratches and hairs and flicker and also lots of grain. So you can see how just by adding Sapphire Film Effect and Film Damage, I've been able to give this a really nice old style filmic effect, which definitely fits the mood and the style of the shot. Now, one last thing I want to point out is just the light flicker on some of these objects. And I've already mentioned a couple of times the lights that I set up in Cinema 4D. And they were quite effective for the speculars, kind of flickering speculars. It's fairly subtle, and I had to decide whether I wanted to go back to Cinema 4D and you know make it a little more obvious or if I could do something in After Effects. And for that, I knew I could turn to one of my favorite Sapphire effects, which is Sapphire Flicker. Just come back into the machine comp. Notice here how we have this lower flicker and upper flicker. I'm gonna turn these other layers off. And we'll look at upper first. So for upper, I didn't really need to change the exposure of the cones. I just wanted to really uh, change the color slightly, add a little bit more pink to them. So for the fill, I've just used a solid layer and I've just masked that off. And I've just used S Flicker. So what that will do is just 
flicker that on and off and you can see I've used the color dodge blend mode we just turn on this background layer as well actually probably not that one let's just turn on the cones just so we can get an idea of what this is doing now obviously this doesn't match the flicker of the ultra zap bolt but that that flicker is pretty consistent it's not like it turns on and off so just some random flicker was fine i didn't have to time anything you can see that it just adds a little bit more of that flicker and adds a bit more of that color as well let's take a look at the bottom one this was slightly different because the, the render out of Cinema 4D came in a little darker than the upper cones, which kind of makes sense because it's below the lid. You can see I've adjusted the exposure and the curves just to make this a little, little more magenta. Turn those off. So exposure to brighten it up. Curves. And remember, this is sitting above uh, the cones layer as well. See, so that's what it looks like by itself. We turn on flicker. This is what we get for that one. And for this, I've not only included the cones, I've also included all this um, metal as well. Because you've got these lightning bolts down here, I figured everything would be um, affected by those bolts. So that on top of the cones gives you this. And that's much more obvious than just the flickering light I set up in Cinema 4D. Now I also thought I could probably add the glass to that as well because it would make sense that the glass was getting brighter with the flickering of the bolt. So to do that I could just select the crypto mat layer and literally just add the glass to the mat. I come up to crypto mat hold down the shift key and click on the glass and it's going to select the background so I'm just going to alt click click on the background and now I've added the glass to that mat as well so you see if I preview this we'll get some flickering of the glass as well which is probably going to be a little more effective Like that. That looks pretty good, doesn't it? And here's the final look once again with the adjustments that we just made. So thanks for watching. Be sure to download the 3D model and give this a go yourself. If you're not using Sapphire, be sure to download a free demo and see how you can use Sapphire to enhance all of your projects.